Hi, everybody. What's going on? Welcome to Sit Down. I'm DJ Sixsmith. Pleasure to be joined today by Jonathan Alter. His very best, Jimmy Carter of Life, brand new book from him. Jonathan, how are you? Good, DJ. How you doing? I'm doing really well. And it's certainly an interesting time to be talking about presidents with everything going on in the news about President Trump yep. and COVID-19. But Jimmy Carter is 96 years old and he is still doing his thing and really just a very interesting life. So what was it like writing this book and, and spending a huge chunk of time with him? Uh, well, you know, it really was, um, I, I have to say, it was one of the great experiences of my life, uh, just being able to do things like, you know, I, I went to Memphis with uh, Carter, uh, Jimmy and Rosalind Carter, and I built a house with them for Habitat for Humanity, or built part of a house, I should say. Uh, and, you know, I spent time in Plains, Georgia, which is a very small community of just a few hundred, and they, um, you know, they're down there uh, before he got, uh, most recently he got, got a little sick. Uh, you know, he would mow the grass at the, at the um, church that they belong to and they'd eat off of uh, paper plates at church suppers and just a very, very modest life. They, when they're in Atlanta for one week a month, at, they slept on a Murphy bed, you oh. know, this is a guy who, um, after he left the presidency, he didn't take any corporate board memberships or corporate speaking fees. When he would take a, a fee for a speech, it would go to the Carter Center, which he, you know, he runs and they, they uh, help eradicate diseases abroad and supervise elections and he engages in, in peacekeeping missions. So um, he really, uh, he's pretty much what you uh, imagine in terms of the way he leads his life. As an individual, and I didn't see this so much, but every so often I glimpse it, there's a toughness under that smile. Uh, he can be a very steely, uh, all business, uh, even you know, sometimes difficult guy, uh, which the public doesn't, doesn't see that Jimmy Carter. There are really three smiles. There's the the one for the, you know, for the public. Then there's a tight-lipped smile when he's angry about something and his eyes flash. And underneath that, there's a, a genuine smile when he um, he gets off a biting line because he can be pretty, um, he has a dry, mordant wit uh, about things uh, that you wouldn't necessarily associate with Jimmy Carter. There's so many different layers to him and even his backstory. I mean, everything you mentioned, this isn't a guy that should have been the president of the United States, but here he finds a way to get to the White House. So what yeah. were some of the keys in his rise? Because we know so much about his life after the presidency, but I'm really curious in how he became the guy in the Oval Office at the end of the day. So um, it, it was really a, a very unlikely story. I mean, one of his... Uh, AIDS once said it was the closest the United States has ever come to picking a name out of a phone book and making that <laughs> president. Um, but the name they picked, you know, had a certain uh, set of skills that really matched the moment in 1976. So, uh, you know, through a dint of effort, he rises to become governor of Georgia. And, um, and then partway through his term, he, uh, he realizes that the candidates for uh, 1972 and then for 1976 in the Democratic Party, they pass through Atlanta. They're not really as smart as he is. And he's wondering, you know, just because they're senators, I, I know more about how to actually govern as a governor than they do. So first he developed the confidence that he could be president. And then he set out two years in advance campaigning. He started out at 0% in the polls. Wow. And, uh, you know, articles in, in his home paper, hometown paper were Jimmy who, like, people thought it was completely crazy. But he went to Iowa. And at that time, the Iowa caucuses were not a big deal. He was the one who turned them into a big deal. And in Iowa, New Hampshire, he, he would uh, just engage in retail politics, just walk down the street, shaking hands, with people, and then he would sleep in their homes, originally out of, um, uh, you know, to save money, uh, because he's very, very cheap. That's a whole other story. <laughs> um, 
But uh, then it turned out that, you know, he'd stay in somebody's home and he would make his, make his bed and he'd chat with them and press the people he stayed with. And then they would tell their friends and sort of, and there'd be an article in the local Iowa or New Hampshire paper and the word would start to spread. Uh, and then he hired really well for his campaign, but mostly he met the moment because this was, he started campaigning in 19. 75. That was just six months after Richard Nixon was forced to resign. And uh, earlier, during what they called the Saturday Night Massacre in the Nixon administration, uh, one of his aides called him and up and said, Jimmy, you're going to be president. This was at a time when nobody was talking about it. Because Carter uh, ran on a moral message, a, a message of renewal. Actually, Joe Biden, who was his first supporter in the Senate when he ran, uh, uh, is sounding some of the same themes. You know, uh, C Carter was talking about a, a, a government as good as its people, more decency, uh, uh, healing the country after Watergate. And then he said, um, you know, I promise I'll never lie to you as president. Now, after the lies of Nixon and, and LBJ before that, Lyndon Johnson, this was a really refreshing message for uh, for voters. And, you know, one of the interesting things is Carter exaggerated and he, he made a number of political mistakes, but he, he did not lie as president. He didn't tell whoppers. And, and in that sense, he kept his most important promise from 1976. So he came out of nowhere and then um, he won Iowa and New Hampshire. Then he had some setbacks. But then in the Florida primary, that's where he really got the nomination. He beat George Wallace, who was the biggest racist in American politics before Donald Trump at the national level. And um, by beating Wallace and ending Wallace's political career, he basically uh, made it clear that moving forward, the Democratic Party would not have room for racist uh, appeals. Uh, even though in his own background, when he, when he had run for governor, he never said anything racist, but he was happy to get the support of racists, you know, with uh, code words and dog whistles. And he wasn't proud of that part of his, uh, of his life. And this book is very much warts and all. I, I try to give a rounded picture of a man in full. So let's go off that point then. You mentioned it before, there were some political mistakes he made during his presidency. What do you think the biggest mistakes were that he made? So I would say uh, two mistakes uh, uh, jump out at me. Um, the biggest one uh, was that in uh, 1979, uh, the year before he had to run for reelection, uh, the Shah of Iran had been pushed out of power in Iran and he was uh, kind of drifting from country to country. Many countries would not accept him. And, and he was in eight different countries before he, he died the following year of, of cancer. So he, when he was in Mexico, uh, there was a lot of pressure on Carter to bring him to the United States. Uh, and Carter had resisted that pressure, uh, strongly resisted. It came from uh, former Secretary of State Henry Kissinger and the Rockefellers, people who had been friends of the Shah. And he said, no, I'm not going to do it. At this time, uh, the Shah's illness was a, a secret. But then it came out that he was sick. And, and Carter got this report that he was sick and that he could only receive medical attention in the United States. That was untrue. That was the Rockefeller people pulling the wool over Carter's eyes because there were plenty of facilities in Mexico that could have treated the Shah just fine. Uh, and you know, maybe he would get slightly better care in the United States, maybe not. As it turned out, his care was poor. Uh, 